Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for our third and final in the three-part series discussing Southern identity. My name is Anderson Cook and I'm the coordinator at the South Carolina State Library and for Read SC, which is the South Carolina affiliate center for the book with the Library of Congress. Melissa? Thanks, Anderson. Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today for this program. I'm Melissa Giblin, Programs Coordinator at North Carolina Humanities. It's my pleasure to be speaking to you all today. Um, at North Carolina Humanities, we aim to bring North Carolinians together to have shared experiences around the humanities and dialogue amongst themselves to create understanding and deeper human connections that can strengthen our statewide community. You can learn more about us and our programs by visiting our website, which will be in the chat, North Carolina Center for the Book is an affiliate of the National Center for the Book and the Library of Congress and is a program of North Carolina Humanities. We are a statewide nonprofit and affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities. Please note that any views, findings, conclusions, opinions, or recommendations expressed by our partners and participants do not necessarily represent those of NC Humanities or the National Endowment for the Humanities. I also have some housekeeping items for you all today. Today's webinar is being recorded. Closed captioning for this program is available. At the bottom of your screen, please click the closed caption CC button and click view subtitles to turn on the closed caption feature. We'd love to hear from you during today's event. If you have a question, please send it through the Q&A button located at the bottom of your screen. I will now turn it back to Anderson to, to introduce tonight's moderator. Thanks, Melissa. Cecilia Thompson serves as Executive Director of Action Greensboro, which is together with the Greensboro Chamber, serves as the city's primary economic and community development agency. In collaboration with business, higher education, and government, Action Greensboro works to strengthen Greensboro's economy. In her role, Thompson leads a variety of efforts from talent and workforce development, K-20 education, urban livability, advocacy, and city marketing efforts. Cecilia also serves as the as a board trustee for NCH since 2019, and she currently resides in beautiful Greensboro, North Carolina. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us tonight, Cecilia. Thank you, Anderson. Um, really glad to be here tonight um, and, and proud member of the North Carolina Humanities and honored to be on that board and have the opportunity to be in these forums. And so I'm excited tonight to to lead a dialogue of two people that I'm really interested in getting to know a lot better. Um, I've learned a lot about them in the last um, couple of weeks and just interested in diving into the details. So I'll first just start to introduce our panelists. The first is Ed Southern. He is the executive director of the North Carolina Writers Network and author of four books, including the most recent publication, Fight Songs, which will be available just next month. Ed also has authored many shorter works in a variety of genres. Prior to his role as executive director of the NC Writers Network, he was the vice president of sales and marketing for the John F. Blair Publisher. He lives in Winston-Salem with his wife, Jamie Southern, who is also the executive director of Bookmarks with their children. So quite the book family. Um, I'll also, I'm um, excited to welcome Micah Cash. Micah Cash is, the, is a photographer and a writer who has published two books, including Waffle House Vistas, and Dangerous Waters, a photo essay of the Tennessee Valley Authority. Micah's work has been widely featured in The Atlantic, Bitter Southerner, and numerous other publications. Micah received his MFA from the University of Connecticut and a bachelor's degree from the University of South Carolina. He lives and works in Charlotte, North Carolina. So welcome, um, full of North Carolinians today. I'm really glad to jump into your work. And so I'm gonna just dive into the first question, which um, maybe we'll start with Ed. Um, can you tell us a little about you, your background, where you grew up, um, who raised you, and how did those experience um, experiences influence your, your book? Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Cecilia, and thank you to uh, NC Humanities and South Carolina Humanities um, for, for inviting me to, to be on this panel. Um, I, I was actually born here in Winston-Salem and uh, lived here till I was about 11 or so. And then we moved to Greenville, South Carolina um, and lived there, came back here to go to Wake Forest, moved away again, uh, lived in Charlotte for a while and then ended up back in Winston-Salem, I hope for good this time. Um, and, I, and I say all that all because it, it, that factors into my book, um, you know, the, the the uprooting that I felt when we moved from Winston-Salem, a place that I thought I would live 
most, if not all of my life and, and ended up in South Carolina and, and all of the um, really in the scheme of things, minor differences that seem so large, you know, when you're 12, 13 years old, um, notably the big difference between uh, Wake Forest and, and Clemson football. Um, so that, that, you know, uh, fight songs really delves into, you know, my own personal history, at least as far as it's relevant to the story of sports in the South and the ways that we use that to shape our identities and, and search for some sense of rootedness, some sense of connection and community. I'm excited to dig into that more as somebody who grew up in a, a big football city of, of Gainesville, Florida, um, and oh. moved to North Carolina. So I you know, I, I feel you about sort of this sense of belonging yeah. and, and, and what that means and those cultural differences, even in the South. So, Michael, um, why don't you share a little bit about you? Yeah, thank you so much for letting me be a part of this forum and for everybody here this evening. I grew up, I was born in Texas, actually, in Texarkana, Texas, spent the first part of my life in Houston. And uh, my parents divorced and my mom remarried. And that's how I ended up in Aiken, South Carolina. And so I did all of my adolescence. I really consider Aiken my hometown. And I went to University of South Carolina in Columbia for my undergraduate degree and got my fill of SEC football, even in, in a horribly mediocre team. Um, you still pack the stadium most days. And then when I graduated, I spent a decade in Baltimore, Maryland. And then from there, went to the University of Connecticut for my master's degree and ended up in Charlotte because my wife and I wanted to be closer to family. She's also from South Carolina and she teaches at UNC Charlotte. And so that's how we wound up in North Carolina. And what's interesting about it is I think my, my 10 to 12 years away from the South um, and away from the messiness of where we live and the history of where we live and the current climate of where we live gives you an interesting perspective. And so it was very easy for me to then start telling stories about people of the South and myself um, represented in those people of the South by looking at it from afar and looking at it in terms of metaphor. Um, and so that led very easily into making a book about the Tennessee Valley Authority and also utilizing Waffle House as this metaphor and framework to talk about who we are and what we build. Mm -hmm. Well, you've talked a little bit about your, your personal experiences and living in the South and growing up in the South, but can you talk about the perspective of writing each of your books? What did you learn about people's personal connections with Waffle House and with, and with college sports? So I'll, I'll hand it back to Ed. Just about everyone that I talked to, in fact, possibly every single person that I talked to about who, who considered themselves a sports fan uh, and particularly a college sports fan uh, connected it in some way to their family, to their parents, to the place that they're from. Um, it was always tied up together. Rarely was there someone who just liked the sports in and of themselves. Um, there was always some kind of deeper meaning, deeper connection. And I mean, I knew going in that that was true in my case. It was uh, interesting to see that it's true in, in just about every case. Yeah, I think that's I think that's spot on. Micah, what about you? Yeah, I think what's interesting about Waffle House is from the way I approached it is when I started my photography project, I was utilizing Waffle House as a metaphor, a metaphor for the working class, a metaphor for a large segment of our country that is struggling to get ahead, that is one paycheck away from poverty and homelessness, right? All these things that we now know about and have been exacerbated by the pandemic. Um, and so that Waffle House was a perfect frame. It was a porch for me to sit on because every store is the same. Um, I was able to conceptually frame those photographs and look out and chronicle and document what we build. And I have long argued that we can see how we value each other and how government and people in charge value us by what we build, by looking out of our windows, um, zip codes, all of the things that we know that can get very messy. And, and I enjoy having messy conversations and asking very pointed questions in the projects that I create. And so the other side that I didn't necessarily think about was when the project began to be published, um, people's relationship to Waffle House is very interesting. I had my own personal relationship to Waffle House, but I was using it in a different way. Um, but what I found was people 
have very specific Waffle House stories and Waffle House presents something very specific in their life, both positive and negative. Um, specific moments, specific feelings, specific decisions that were made in that Waffle House that they visited. And so what this project did and the way I photographed the pieces by including about a third of each photograph inside the restaurant and then the rest of it looking out is people can read themselves in those photographs. And so they can take their specific Waffle House experience and put it in the photograph. And so that became the jumping start for many of the conversations I've had with people since this project became published, which is let me tell you about my relationship to Waffle House. Um, and you tell me yours. And so that that's something I honestly did not think would happen. And it did happen because I, I underestimated how strongly people feel about, I mean, what is a fast food chain, essentially. It, it sort of plays off that metaphor of like walking in somebody else's shoes. It's like sitting in somebody else's Waffle House um, booth or yeah. something like yeah. that. Um, yeah. So how do you think that experience um, traveling and talking to people and this institution that I think was initially a metaphor, but became so much more to you, how did that shape your identity? or maybe continues to? I mean, I think in some ways it's it's the reverse of that where it's not Waffle House shaping my identity so much as I and everyone else shapes the identity of what Waffle House is to them. Waffle House, the chain, Waffle House HQ outside of Atlanta, they don't necessarily care so long as I guess you're remotely satisfied with your meal. Um, but Waffle House means something to people's identity across the spectrum, no matter you know where you're from, who you are, what language you speak, where you live, um, what color you are, your heritage, all of that. I've sat in Waffle Houses with and hearing five languages at one time. I have visited Waffle Houses in rural, suburban and urban locations, all built in very different places, um, all serving very different populations. Um, but all of those people are perceiving themselves and their identity in one way or another. And so one of the things that I think was common across all of that, and we know not to be true because I mean, certainly wealthy individuals will eat at a Waffle House if they want to, but it is a place that seemed to have a certain group of people coalesce in that space, feel comfortable in that space as a space where they were not judged, um, where they could come in, they could eat, they could make plans, uh, whatever those plans would be in a space where you can come as you are. And I found that really interesting. And it made, in you know, visiting as many stores as I did, it made me feel comfortable in, in many ways. And it made me feel okay to talk about issues of poverty, issues of how hard it is to be working class in this country, um, how hard it is to get over that hump that people say you can obviously get over if you work hard. Um, because I was surrounded by people and talking to people and I've lived that life myself where it's not that easy. Uh, I mean, suddenly you have the solidarity and, and Waffle House became the central point that everybody could focus around. Same time, I mean, like kicking it back to Ed, you know, when I'm in the stadium on a Saturday and more importantly, when I'm in front of the stadium tailgating on a Saturday and everybody's eating and sharing their fried chicken and doing what they can do, we're there for a common purpose. And even when you're up against one of your worst teams that's a rival, right? I can say this as an SEC fan, man, you still know you're in the right conference. And so like you, you could even have people that don't like each other at the end of that day could come back and be like, yeah, you're going to make it to Atlanta, but I'll root for you. So long as you're going to beat Clemson, that's all I care about. <laughs> well, I yeah, think you yeah. have shaped your identity a little bit in the sense of being more comfortable sort of talking about economic and racial yep. disparities and, and being transparent mm -hmm. about the, the realities of, of what we're are. So I don't want to, you know, put words in your mouth, but I, I heard you. No, but that you're uh, absolutely right. That was much yeah. more eloquent. Yeah. Um, so Ed, let's go back to what you've learned about personal connections um, to college sports through your writing. Oh, um, I think, I mean, Micah set it up pretty well, the, you know, the, the idea of the common purpose for everyone that's gathered together in a stadium or even outside for the tailgate. Um, I do think that, that it provides something that a lot of people find lacking in their lives these days, you know, th that sense of common purpose, that sense of community, um, even just the, the sense of a shared interest with this many people. Um, and there is, you know, ideally, even between rival fan bases, there's, you know, 
a sense of community. You know, South Carolina and Clemson fans may not want to admit it, but, you know, they, they are locked in something together. You know, um, they do share a state with each other. Right. Um, you know, and, and sports becomes a way to, you know, you talked about Waffle House as a metaphor. Sports becomes a great way to um, symbolize, um, you know, common interests, but also disparate interests within a, a common space. And um, I don't know, it, it, it's an interesting way in, in which to find personal connections because I, in working on the book, um, and even before I started working on the book, I kept almost stumbling across personal connections that I would have through with people. And, and oftentimes that was through um, the, me, the medium of, of college sports uh, one way or another. It was, you know, once you start looking for connections, you find them everywhere. So I'm curious, you know, when we think about college sports as sort of a mechanism for community building, I'm sure you found a lot of that, even sort of you're saying within rivalry, you're finding that community building through that. And so do you have any, you know, specific stories or um, additional thoughts? Well, one of the interesting things that I found um, that I, I sort of in, in the back of my mind knew, but, but when, you know, you start working on a book, it becomes, it moves from the back to the forefront of your mind, is that the, the, the real rise of the popularity of, of college sports and especially college football in most of the South, also the rise of college basketball in North Carolina and in the ACC coincided um, not just with the advent of television, but with what uh, C. Van Woodward called the bulldozer revolution, mm -hmm. um, which was this you know massive upheaval in the, the post-World War II era in the South where you had um, uh, so many people moving off of farms, moving out of rural areas and into the towns, the cities in the South uh, that according to, to one historian that I read, it was uh, a, the, the, not in terms of sheer numbers, but in terms of proportion of population, it was equivalent to the great migration out of Ireland because of the potato famine. It was that um, disruptive um you know with, with with this people on the move and i i feel like um spectator sports which in the south at that time you know the highest level of spectator sports was college sports there were no major league pro teams yet that didn't happen until 1966 when um the, the braves came to atlanta as a major league baseball team um I feel like, you know, the rooting for your favorite college team in football or in North Carolina in basketball became sort of a substitute for, you know, the sense of small town community that a lot of people felt like they'd left behind. And it was a way to, to, to join in with other people while still feeling some sense of rootedness um, in picking a team to root for. One of the questions that I never quite was able to answer for myself in 200 however many pages of, of writing this book was, you know, is that sense of community a substitute for actual community? Is it an adequate substitute for actual community? Or is it just a simulacrum um, where you get the feel of community, but you don't get the real thing? Um, I, I, I still don't know how to answer that. Yeah. I'm not sure I do. I mean, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I'm thinking about things that I don't think we know how to answer. Ed and I had a conversation about a month or two ago where we were talking about these two things, these two cultural phenomena, right? College sports and Waffle House and how we as Southerners try to own them, right? Like, what is it about the ownership of these institutions? Waffle House is in 25 states. Um, I'm pretty sure if you go to the big house, a fight song matters a lot when they pack that stadium. But why do we as Southerners feel that we have the proper ownership of these things? And like, I can't answer that, and it's, but it's really interesting. Why was I compelled in Waffle House Vistas to only visit Southern states and look through the windows and not go into Indiana or go all the way out to Arizona? Um, I still don't really have an answer to that other than it felt right because yeah. Waffle House is a Southern institution, right? It's something mm -hmm. that we perceive as Southern. It, it started in Atlanta, didn't it? 
Yes, and their headquarters is still outside of Atlanta. Yeah. I mean, I think of it as something that you, you know, even though you can find it outside the South for so long, you could find it only in the South. Um, and, and, and perhaps that does give us some kind of claim of ownership on it. Um, with college football, uh, as Clemson and Alabama fans would, would be quick to point out, you know, the South has all but one of the last, uh, oh gracious, mm -hmm. uh, something like 16 national championships. Right. Um, you know, uh, but if we went by population, right, Penn State pulls in how many people a Saturday in Michigan, how many, you know, like, right, there's we're, different we're metrics. About championship rings. So, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know anything about that. I'm a South Carolina fan, and let's okay. talk about <laughs> the two years of baseball. They were glorious years, my friend. Yeah. Yeah. But I think that's, that's you know, I and, and, you know, that's kind of uh, a, a thread in Southern history and in a lot of fields mm -hmm. is, is that tendency to we find something we, we like, we tend to claim it as ours, uh, even in the face of overwhelming evidence. You know, we, we say this is something unique to us or something that we do uniquely well, even if we don't. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I, exactly. Even if I'm trying yeah. to poke holes in it, it still feels right. Yeah. I think you guys are a segue to the question you're probably already answering about sort of what is the the southern southern experience you know that identity of waffle house and college sports what does that reveal about the human experience and it's this i think it's sort of so related to community building and sort of this 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 we versus an i you know it's like um the ownership factor and i don't know if you have any more to kind of share about that michael you want to try that first shared experiences probably <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I do think that's correct. Um, whereas the I in my book and in my experiences tends to be people's individual relationships with Waffle House. Waffle House in itself is a communal experience. Um, even when you're in a restaurant with 25 other people and you're not talking to each other, you've all chosen to enter, sit down and eat at a Waffle House. And you're having relatively the same experience from a food perspective. Um, but it's the parameters, it's the, it's the environment that you've chosen to enter into um, and the expectations and comfort level that that brings. Um, no one expects to get wowed at a Waffle House, right? It's very different than some kind of Sunday brunch you might take some people coming from out of town to um, with like biscuits that have stuff in them and things, you know. Um, you, they don't have any of that, right? That, you know, you get some eggs, you get some bacon, it's gonna be the same in all 25 states. So that expectation creates a level of comfort because that's exactly what you're looking for. Um, and when you're in that space, if it's done properly, right? And we know it isn't always that way. And if it is a space that is safe and egalitarian, um, everybody at that moment is very equal. Um, you know, you can be sitting next to Jay-Z and Beyonce and you're absolutely equal because they're eating the same mediocre food that you are. Um, that just happens to taste really great because at that time, that's what you wanted. So that's pretty interesting. And, and that idea that then we all have had that common experience. And so then when you come to these photographs in the book, people can stand in front of that photograph, have very different experiences from a personal level, but share that commonality of a Waffle House and say, well, my store was outside Auburn. And this person will say, well, my store when I was in college was in downtown Charleston. And let me tell you about the crazy things that happened there. I won't get into the my stores. And I'm going to hand it over to oh, you sure. to talk about the human experience. <laughs> well, that, that's what I was going to say. All right, first of all, this 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 discussion has taken a very dark turn, and and Mike, I have to object to you describing Waffle House food as mediocre. Um, please, you know, please again, in my even in my virtual you presence, got it. Uh, I'll I'll withhold myself. Um, but it's funny because you know you, you start talking about uh, you know your Waffle House, and I I know I'm supposed to be you know talking about college sports and fight songs, but I, I I'm, would love to sit around and just swap Waffle House stories because we do, you know, and it, and it changes through time and, and, you know, it meets different needs. You know, what, one of the things I talk about in the book is, you know, growing up in the eighties in the suburbs outside Greenville, South Carolina, you know, there were no, uh, there were no local hangouts for places where, where people could go, you know, um, and, you know, I'd grown up watching Happy Days and just figured, you know, you'd, you'd have, when you got to be a teenager, you'd have your, your Arnold's that everybody hung out at and you did. We had, there was a Burger King on East North Street 
and there was the Waffle House uh, on Pelham Road right by I-85. And, um, you know, th those were the places you could go after a football game on a Friday night. Um, but, you know, the public places that you could go, you know, not counting various parking lots or somebody's house if their parents were away. And so, you know, what, what I was looking for from that Waffle House then was very different from what I was looking for in, in a Waffle House in college um, versus, you know, what I was looking for, what I'm looking for from a Waffle House now um, at, at my age that will go numberless. Um, and I think it's the same thing in college where you know, I think there is something about, there's a, a nice balance of a, of a uniformity of experience with uh, a uniqueness of experience when you're talking about, you know, uh, going to a game, going to an Alabama football game at Bryant Denny Stadium is a very different experience than going to a Clemson game at Death Valley uh, or a, certainly, which is a different experience than going to an LSU game at what they call Death Valley. And I'll let any LSU and Clemson fans on this fight that out uh, versus going to a Wake Forest game um, here at our home stadium. Um, which is named after a bank, and I refuse to say the name now. Um, but at the same time, you know, it, it, it is all, you know, in so, certain fundamentals, it's all the same experience. You know, you're going to have marching bands playing. You're going to have tailgaters. You're going to have um, the teams running out um, before the start of the game. You're going to have the national anthem. You're going to have, you know, the anticipation and the excitement of kickoff. Um, you know, you're going to have the game itself. Um, which is such a, a great, you know, uh, one of the, the, the writers that I, I talked to for the book um, told me, uh, Alex McDaniel, she told me that she feels like football is the most cinematic sport. Um, another writer, Eric Wilson, who uh, played, was a high school football star himself, um, talks about, you know, how football has the four acts and an intermission, you know, and, and you have the, the great set pieces of, you know, the long pass or uh, the breakaway run or the kickoff return uh, or the interception. Um, and so there is, like I say, you know, there are enough differences to sort of keep it interesting when you go from one place to another. But at the same time, you're, you're still getting the same thing each time you go. It's yeah. just, you know, the small differences are what you come for. Yeah. I think that's really interesting because there's also a lot of spectacle. Yeah. Um, so if I'm if I'm visiting at somebody, Waffle Houses, yeah, I mean, but the but the spectacle could be quite different at a Waffle House, right? But but if I'm visiting somebody in Athens and it's a Saturday and they have tickets, I may not root for Georgia at all, but I want to go experience that if I've never been there, right? Yeah. Like that's an experience that you want to have with somebody on the inside, right? Not necessarily me there representing my team, but like, let me go there. Let me see what these traditions and spectacles are. Um, whereas a Waffle House is very generic and the spectacle and, and the local culture provides what is inside that community. And, and that's one of the things that I have found so intriguing about not only Waffle House in itself, but when you go to so many of them is each one is representative of the local culture of that place. The people that go to that specific restaurant choose to go to that specific restaurant. The people that work at that restaurant more than likely live pretty close to that restaurant. And so you can have like my hometown of Aiken, South Carolina, I believe has four waffle houses within the city limits. All four are drastically different and have very different cultures within them at all hours of the day. Is so a classy waffle house, kind of like there's a, there's a nice small, in most or used to no be. no there's no classy waffle house although i did go to one um you know I've, I've been going to different ones on different poverty levels on the scale so what is a waffle house like in the most affluent county of the state versus one of the poorest counties of this state mm -hmm. there are differences but a lot of them tend to be on the architectural level right like a newer waffle house might be in a more affluent area and they're like you know what this is a good plot of land outside of this lowe's and this home depot in this fancy strip mall, let's put a restaurant there. Um, whereas the ones in lower poverty areas tend to either be close to urban centers that are really down on their luck or the ones that are on the highways. And those are purely transient. So the only local culture really in that Waffle House is gonna be the people that are working because everybody else is on the road. 
Um, yeah. And so that's a very different experience than the Waffle House next to a Lowe's hardwood sto hardware store. Yeah. It's funny. Can I, Cecilia, do you, mind if, do you mind if we keep talking Waffle House just a little bit? Yes. I, I think we have, um, yes, we have time. Let's keep talking Waffle House. Well, I, I just wanted to, to echo that point because, um, you know, I find myself now living very close to where I went to college. And so what should be my Waffle House is the same as, as my Waffle House in college, where, you know, we would, me and some friends would often go and use it as a study hall an all night study hall. Um, I rarely go to that one. What I tend to think of as, as mine is uh, in, of all places, Jefferson, Georgia, because at least in the before times, you know, my, my wife and our daughter had a tradition of, you know, we would drive down to see my wife's family in Alabama on Christmas day and Waffle House is usually the only place open. And so, um, you know, it's, just, it's this one in Jefferson that we keep stopping at uh, to get our, our, our Christmas dinner, um, at the Waffle House. And it is, a, a, you know, like you say, it's a very, you know, it's, it's a, it's a strange sort of communal experience because most of us there are passing through, you know, we're on our way from and to other places. And so it's a very strange kind of community that we come together in, in, in this Waffle House on Christmas day. So I think that leads to a, a good question about both college sports and Waffle House being gathering places. They're places for communal activity, places where you meet up to study or traditions or whatever that may be. And of course, you know, over the last 16 months, we haven't been able to do a lot of that activity due to the pandemic. And so I'm curious about your perspectives on sort of the cultural impact of the pandemic on experiences um, like going to a college sporting event or even meeting up late night um, after maybe a, not a bar visit um, <laughs> in, in the height of the pandemic. So, um, Ed, do you want to chime in? Yeah, you know, my, my wife and I uh, had said that going back to sporting events was going to be sort of our, uh, that was our sign that we had gotten through, we, that we made it through the pandemic. Um, of course, uh, you know, that turns out not to be the case. You know, we went to a, a couple of minor league baseball games this summer and I, you know, I don't know what we'll be doing as we go into fall. Um, I think, you know, uh, uh, something that I address kind of obliquely in the book is, um, you know, a lot of decisions in major college sports these days are made with, um, television in mind more than the fans which is short-sighted because, you know, TV money is only as good as the fans who are interested enough to keep paying for the cable packages or the streaming service and tune in to watch the games. Um, and I think something that I hope everyone involved in the business of sports um, learned in the pandemic was how important the fan experience is even to the people watching on home, watching at home on TV. Um, uh, I think it was the Bundesliga, the German uh, professional soccer was one of the first uh, to come back. And of course they were playing in front of empty arenas. And, and the first weekend, you know, sports fans, even if they weren't soccer fans tuned in because finally we were getting live sports again. And everyone commented on how eerie and disconcerting and disorienting it was not to hear fans as this game's being played. It doesn't affect your viewing of the game at all, but to not have the roar of the crowd in the background was really off-putting. And so uh, the Bundesliga and then subsequently as other uh, sports leagues began playing again, they would pipe in crowd noise. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if they were playing in front of empty stadiums, they still, they, they would have the PAs playing can you know like like a laugh track on a sitcom they would be playing canned the canned sound of fans cheering because otherwise you were losing tv viewers and so i, I hope that you know what what the sports industry learned is that it still comes back to that shared experience of bringing people together for that common purpose of of rooting for the home team or against the home team um you know, it all comes down to the fans and to the passion for it. 
Yeah. Even a hologram of yourself in the stadium is not the same, right? Not, <laughs> not at all. Well, Micah, I think that the gathering place at Waffle House is a, a, different, um, a different idea because it didn't just affect the people that were going to Waffle House, but it certainly affected also the people that were working there. And so can you talk a little about, yeah. you know, you interacted with a lot of staff that were making minimum wage or less probably, um, and sort of that, what your perspective with your, with your new identity on that? Yeah, I mean, you know what, what I think is interesting about the past 16 months from a broad standpoint and, and sports, whether amateur, college, Olympics even, right, pro sports, all of this plays into it as well as our relationship with food and service, which is, you know, people, humanity, who we are, we are built to be packed into stadiums next to each other, all sweaty on a Saturday, right? We're built to have communal experiences and bazaars and markets across the world where you're on top of each other. Um, you know, there was that beautiful moment this summer for like a month, maybe six weeks where everybody was like, yo, I'm vaccinated. Everything is open. I'm going to go celebrate the July 4th. I went to this mm -hmm. thing at a park. There's like 15,000 people there. And I'm like standing in line for a corn dog. And I was like, yes, yeah, this is the way our species is supposed to be, right? We're all sweaty. We're all stinky. We're all there to celebrate a holiday. Um, and when that's taken away from us and for the right reasons taken away from us, because you want to be able to be safe when you go to that stadium. You want to be able to be safe when you go eat and have a two hour meal with people that you care about. Um, multiple courses, talk to the servers, have the servers sit down with you because they're a part of that experience. Because when you think back on, on an eating experience, it's not always just the people you're with, right? It's the ambiance, it's the atmosphere, it's what's on the walls, it's how the service was from the server that was helping you and curating that menu with you that evening. Um, and yeah, that seems really lofty, but even at a Waffle House, like, the service there is usually pretty great. The people are really nice and they'll sit and talk to you as long as they're not too busy. And that was my experience visiting all those stores. And so I've been thinking a lot about that. I've been thinking a lot about, um, you know, how, like, what is, like, how does that feel when it's gone for so long? Because we clearly need it. Um, and what's interesting about this pandemic versus the one 100 years ago is we're documenting it every day with videos and, and photographs and streaming technology and all of this stuff. And we're living it in real time, but we're also documenting it in a way that we know it will end eventually. Like we know like history and science says, this is how this thing will end. It's just when. And then how do we get back to a place where we all feel safe again to go have that two hour dinner packed in a restaurant um, and those tiny two person tables, you know, like next to each other. And, and from a Waffle House standpoint, that communal space um, is something that is very valued uh, because you remember those experiences. And, and I don't wanna go eat somewhere and spend 25 minutes fearful that I'm too close to someone or have. And I was just, I just did some, some field work where I went to a couple Waffle Houses and it's not like the server came up to my table with the coffee. I was shouted at from 20 feet away. Do you want more coffee? Yes, I'll bring you a new cup, right? It's very different than someone coming to me and having just a snippet conversation um, while, while they held that urn. Um, it wasn't enjoyable, I'll be honest with you. It straight up wasn't enjoyable. Well, I think your 4th of July corn dog experience is a testament to the human nature of wanting to get back to normal and be around crowds. Awesome. And so, I mean, um, yeah, I went to a, I went to a minor league baseball game too. There's like 6,500 people there. And it was the first time in 13 months from like pressed back to back to somebody waiting for beer. And like every 15 minutes, you know, I'd break out into a cold sweat, but it was so great to be with people that I did not know and watch a sport that I love. Very cool. So like that can get me through another year if we have to do this, right? Like that one experience of watching a baseball game live and paying way too much for food and beer because the revenue stream had dried up for a year and a half. So now it's like $8 for a pretzel. <laughs> like what is going on? It doesn't but even matter anymore. Yeah. I loved it. I, I still, I, 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 yeah, I swiped the card. Give me that $8 pretzel. I did it too. Yeah. Thanks yeah. for grasshoppers. 
Um, well, we have a very active um, chat chat room. I've seen it popping up in the corner, people sharing their menu favorites at Waffle House, all the things. But before we go to that, I want to give you both an opportunity to share about what upcoming projects that you're working on. Um, Ed, where to get your book? It's coming out soon. Micah, where to buy um, your book? So um, Michael, why don't, Michael, why don't you start? Uh, yeah, so if you would like to buy a copy of Waffle House Vistas, you can get the link from my website, micacash.com, or you can go to the publisher, The Bitter Southerner, at bittersouthener.com. Uh, they are the publisher and exclusive producer of it, so I link to their site as well. You cannot get it in stores. It is only through them, so if you're interested, you can do that, and if you want to email me and get it signed, you can ship it to me and all that kind of stuff. Or if you're in North Carolina, we can hang out. Um, Love it. So go to that's, Charlotte. that's how you get yeah go to Charlotte um, that's how you can get a copy of that book Ed what about you it's coming out coming out the, Tell us about the it. official pub date is September 7th but uh, there are copies out there uh, available right now you can order it from bookshop.org or from the publisher uh, whose website is polaripub.com um, I'm a big fan of independent bookstores and so I uh, it would, it would mean a lot to me personally if you ordered it from your own local independent bookstore, wherever that is. Um, if you don't have a local independent, you can order it from my wife's uh, bookmarksnc.org. Super. Well, hopefully Scoppernog Books in Greensboro is going to have it. They are. Scoppernog does have it. They're great Excellent. folks over there. Um, yes. We're, I've got we're, my copy we're on order. Good big fans of them. Awesome. And Micah, I think the other thing about ordering your books is if you're in that bookshop, they have great t-shirts that say things like tomato and mayo on them. Am I right? They do. On that yeah, website, you can, Bitter Southern? yeah. Put the book in the cart <laughs> first and then look for other stuff. So that you have and then the t-shirt that says mayonnaise on it. Yeah. And I yeah. have a really, like cool. they have really great t-shirts. Um, all right. Um, they're a good, good. publisher. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I follow them. I am the fan. Um, all right. Well, Melissa, I know we have some questions in the chat, so I'm going to let you jump in and, and ask some questions. Thanks, Cecilia. I just want to highlight a couple of our favorite Waffle House dishes that people shared. Victoria said her favorite is a pecan waffle with a side of bacon and sweet iced tea. And then yeah, we also good. had um, Sherry uh, tell us that a friend visited her from Seoul, South Korea, and the first place she asked to visit was Waffle House because it is famous on YouTube, and she got pancakes <laughs> and the paper hat. Yes. Pancakes at Waffle House? Did they make them for it? I don't, can you even get them? <laughs> I guess, I guess so. Did they just take waffle batter and put it oh on the goodness. griddle, I bet? Maybe. That would be a really great, um, great experiment i guess mm -hmm. at the next time you're at a waffle house to see if you can get pancakes um, waffle we, right there in the name what <laughs> well um we do have a couple questions though so i do want to make That's sure okay. i highlight those um so uh one of the questions uh for micah is that um you talked a lot about sense of community at waffle house but um there are not often a lot of people pictured in the photos. Was the decision to not always include um, as many maybe diners in the restaurant, um, how, how did that come about? Yeah, so that's a great question. And there's two answers to that. One is the project, the physical photographs and the concept behind the project is documenting what is built next to Waffle Houses and where Waffle Houses are located. And so I, the, the impetus for the project started when I was at a Waffle House and I looked up and I was next to a Dollar General. And I thought to myself, hmm, I wonder how many Waffle Houses are next to a Dollar General? Because my mind is revolving around narratives of socioeconomics and demographics and like racial politics and all of this stuff. And, and this idea in America that you actually can become quite wealthy by making money off the poor. Um, and so how do I talk about that? And most people will, you know, geographers, sociologists, smarter people than me will go to data and try to find out that how many Waffle Houses are next to a Dollar General. But artists don't do that. Artists get in their cars and travel to 65 Waffle Houses over 11 states to see if they can prove this, this hypothesis. Um, and, and so the project itself is looking at what we build and thinking about that through those narratives. And so when we structured the book, 
Um, I knew when we put it together in a book and when we published the piece for the first time on Bitter Southerner online, that my essay had to be about community because it had to be about what I was not showing in the photographs by choice. Um, I also, as an artist, like it when somebody picks up a book about Waffle House and expects to see pictures of diners and servers and cooks. And that's not what I give you. Um, I'm forcing you to look at the world that we build outside those doors. And sometimes it's really great. Sometimes it's really bleak. Um, but that idea that I, as the artist, get to then dictate the conversation as it starts. And then we can start talking about things like community was really important to me. And that's why my essay in the book is very centered around community and centered around what Waffle House means to people. Um, because the photographs have something different. Um, and so, yes, it was very, it was very conscious not to do that. And if there were people outside doing stuff, perfect. And if they're in the shots, I'm going to make it. Great question, though. Awesome. Thank you. And hot off the press, we do have a correction. The woman from South Korea did order waffles. <laughs> okay. All is right with the world. All is, all is right. <laughs> Um, okay, so we've got a second question here. Um, we have, have a couple from Anderson. Uh, Anderson's first question is, she is curious about what your favorite and her most memorable experiences are at a sporting event or a Waffle House, or if you'd also like to answer what your favorite dish is at a Waffle House, that would be that'd probably be great too. Oh, gracious. Go ahead, Ed. Um, let's see. My... My, my favorite experience of a sporting event, easily. Um, I was at the, uh, I got to go to the 1995 ACC tournament in, at Greensboro Coliseum um, and was there when Wake Forest beat Carolina in the tournament finals to win their first uh, ACC championship since uh, 1960 or 61. And, uh, and especially to beat Carolina to do it, um, it, it, I was not the only grown person weeping in the stands uh, when, when the final horn sounded. So that, that was, I mean, that, you know, I, 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 I'm not sure that anything in my life will even come close to that sporting experience. So, Yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting. I remember every sporting event, college football sporting event that I went to. I remember every college football basketball event I went to because I, I went to UConn for two years. I was actually there the year both men and women won in the same year, the national title. And that's when I had the most kinship with my student body because I was teaching at the time. And they were like so excited. And I was like, oh, I get y'all now because that's how I feel on football season. And that, that's how they feel um, when they're winning. And um, so that was an interesting communal experience to be with uh, an undergraduate population winning a national title and like just destroying the campus in excitement and having that be normal. Um, you know, like, like people expected that to happen, but, but yeah, I remember all the football games. What's interesting is Ed and I, last time we hung out, we were at the same football game and we we remembered that game vividly. I'm not going to talk about what the game was, but it was awesome to be in a space be like, Oh, I was at that game. It was like 10 years ago. And Ed was at that game. And we remembered like the emotional tension of that game and the unpredictability of when you get a whole bunch of like 19 year old kids on a field and a crowd that can rally those kids or dis or like psych the other team out and like crazy things can happen in sports. Um, I've been to games where it was like 49 to three in the first quarter. And I vividly remember at what point in the second quarter I walked out of that game <laughs> um, because we were getting killed. And I didn't want to be taunted by the other team for the rest of the game. So, you know, I think it's, it's powerful. Sports, sports is really powerful. And the Waffle House situation becomes powerful because I think amazing things will happen to you or an amazing thing happens because you decide to do it, right? A lot of the Waffle House stories I've heard from people have been people that have made life-changing decisions at that one meal, at that one Waffle House, or they were in a specific Waffle House because it was the only space that they feel they belonged. Um, they, the space in high school where they could go to learn how to be who they are and learn how to deal with their identity and present their identity confidently in a town that maybe had rejected them or a high school that had rejected them or parents that had rejected them. That's powerful. Um, and that Waffle House would never ever know that that happened. That was an internal thing, right? 
And, and so those memories are really powerful when, when they happen to us or when you're with in a stadium full of 75, 80,000 people witnessing something spectacular. One, one of the things that I found, um, you know, before, during, after working on this book was that I, you rarely see adults' eyes light up the way they do when you discover you were both at the same game. You know, um, when I mentioned this this one particular South Carolina game to Micah, I was there. You know, and 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 I'll you know I'll talk about other games. If I mentioned the ACC tournament final in 1995, I was there. You know, I mean, it really they become like kids in candy stores. It really is. I mean, it's it's a weirdly powerful sense of connection that people feel just from being two of however many tens or hundreds of thousands were at this same place at the same time. Yeah, well, having that same experience, that's a really good point. Cecilia, do you want to um, let everyone know your favorite uh, college sports memory or what you like to order at Waffle House? <laughs> that is, you know, I'm not sure. I, I I have grown up in a college town and and never gotten terribly into um, into college sports. <laughs> I think what what I that experience growing up in a city that was such a college town was about through this human connection around shared experiences and shared brand. And we talk about economic development and communities. We often talk about, you know, what is that one thing that holds us together? And oftentimes in college town, that is that it's either a sporting event or it's a, the colors that are the, the retails that you see along the streets. And so sort of those, those roots run deep and they're, and they're greater than what, what we're talking about in terms of the human connection and that shared experience is really sort of an economic thread for many Southern communities. And so um, that's sort of my relation to them. And, and we're lucky enough to have seven colleges and universities here in Greensboro, and two state institutions. So there's some healthy rivalry, but we don't have, we don't have similar colors. We just have lots of, you know, lots of colors um, for college sports here. So I found this um, conversation really exciting. So, and a great, great combo. Um, I guess we will, um, Anderson, do we have time for one more question? Then go for it. <laughs> uh, last question really quick is, how do you think your respective institutions, so that of the Waffle House and that of um, college sports, change the literal and metaphoric landscape when they are built? We can, um, we can be positive or really cynical in terms of this, this answer, Ed. Or I know both we can. at the same time. Yeah. Uh, both at the same time. Let's do it. Well, I, well I'm, I'm going to jump in real quick and, and if you if you have a winning uh particularly football because it brings in so many people and it's such an event um you know one of the things that I, I learned shortly after moving to Greenville was that on football Saturdays Clemson South Carolina which is tiny becomes something like the fourth largest city in South Carolina and you know that was back in the 80s now they have what they call, I mean, they literally, economists call it the Dabo effect um, with the success that Dabo Sweeney has brought them, where you've got um, an explosion of hotels, you know, all through Anderson County along I-85 into Pickens County, into Clemson, uh, new restaurants, simply because of the, the people who flock to Death Valley to watch Clemson football every Saturday. And, you know, that they, 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 make their fiscal year during the fall. They don't care if they sit empty the rest of the year. Um, and so, you know, that that is a, a literal change in the landscape. And you mentioned, you know, the, the workers that, you know, oftentimes were laid off uh, in the past year in the pandemic, you know, Lord knows how many people uh, in places like Clemson, Tuscaloosa, Alabama, probably in Gainesville, um, you know, lost their livelihood when, you know, full crowds couldn't come to the stadiums anymore. Yeah, yeah. Really I'll add Ed, that our to... public our public schools closed on homecoming. Are they still do <laughs> in Gainesville? Yeah, that's yeah. real. Yeah. yeah. Um, Mike, I know you. Yeah. This is right your wheelhouse, so you you take it away. Yeah, I was just gonna say it was really hard not for me to roll my eyes when you talked about the Debo effect and all of that, but I'm gonna be polite tonight. Um, I think you're absolutely right, and I think too that that dark nature of it and we're seeing the change, right? Students can make money now. Um, I think it's wonderful. I know a lot of people disagree with me, 
Um, but I wish that wasn't the case for the Bojangles worker in these college towns. They're still making crap money. Um, but if, if you're now the fourth largest city in town and you're serving Bojangles in Columbia, South Carolina or Clemson, South Carolina, you deserve to be making 25, 30 grand uh, or, you know, 25, 30 an hour. So, so, you know, like I think, you know, that trickles down right now that schools have to pay students and stu or, or students can now have these licensing deals in a way that before they were profiting off of them. Um, I think in terms of Waffle House too, it's really interesting is in some of these um, poorer towns, towns without as much wealth, without as much economic opportunity, Waffle House is a boon, right? It is a really good job. Waffle House is a corporation hires from within. So if, if you, you know, have the, the drive and the motivation and, and the smarts to do it, you can go all the way to the HQ office um, from being just a fry cook, I mean, a line cook um, and, and do it rather rapidly, honestly. Um, they can be good jobs. I talk to people that'll be like, you know, I'm going to the Waffle House down the street because it pays me a buck more an hour um, because they're on that track. Um, it's also a place of refuge, a place of community. I think at the same time, there's a, another cynical side to look at it in terms of the landscape and the economics of it, that a Waffle House straight up will raise the value of that property. Um, I think I've heard um, rumors that, you know, Waffle Houses won't even be built in a place unless there's a certain number of hotels already there or enough space for the hotels to be built because I've heard from also people in the hospitality industry that they want to build enough space that's near the Waffle House, um, particularly if you're like the residence in type Hampton Inn style. Um, and then eventually Waffle House will sell that land and build a new store a mile away because they've now raised the value of that property, flipped it and moved it down. Um, you know, so I think just like anything, right, it's complicated, it's messy. And like I said at the beginning of this, I love these messy conversations when we can talk about the pros and the negatives of, of these sort of pillars in Southern society, because we know we have both of those. And I think it's only, imp it's important to acknowledge both of those. Um, but certainly most people I talk to, you know, Waffle House is something that is very good to them as, as a worker or as a place where I can go and eat my eggs that are not mediocre. They're quite good, especially with cheese um, or, or work if I need a gig, you know, for a couple of weeks at a time or if I need to make my rent, nothing wrong with that. All right, well, thank you all um, so much for that conversation and a special thanks to Micah Cash. Please go check out Waffle House Vistas and Ed Southern. Please go take a look at uh, Fight Songs, which will be coming out next month. And a very special thank you to Cecilia Thompson for moderating this evening's event and for asking um, all of these wonderful questions and leading our two authors uh, through this very engaging um, conversation that we hope you all were able to connect with. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Anderson for the final word, word for this evening. Thanks, Melissa. Yes. Thank you again, all, all, both of our authors and also Cecilia for moderating tonight. Uh, it was such an engaging conversation. I hope that all of our attendees uh, enjoyed it as much as I certainly did. On behalf of Reed SC and the North Carolina Humanities Center for the Book, thank you for joining us. We really appreciate it and we look forward to sharing with you again soon. Um, all three of these conversations are recorded and will be on YouTube if they are not already. So you're welcome to reach out to the authors directly, watch this again, purchase their books. And in the meantime, we hope you will stay safe and be well. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you all.